This is the second in a four-part lecture on schooling, psychometric testing and eugenics, drawing from the book Benign Violence, Education in and Beyond the Age of Reason. In this second part I will explore the further development of intelligence testing and the hypothesis of intelligence. Following Binet, who developed the first intelligence tests in the early 20th century, there were two hypotheses about what intelligence was. The measured intelligence of an individual was either, it was hypothesized, a single attribute, or it was the accumulated effect of diverse factors. Charles Spearman, a member of the Eugenic Society, advanced the former hypothesis, arguing that intelligence is a sort of mental energy. He labelled it G. The Binet-Simon tests had come very close to measuring this underlying brain power, Spearman argued. However, all tests are complicated, he claims, by more specific factors which he labelled S. These are special abilities that help in some tasks but not in others, unlike G, which helps in all tasks. The strategic advantage for Spearman of his two-factor theory of intelligence was that it neatly explained the profound difficulties involved in designing a perfect intelligence test, that is, a test that measured pure G. The two-factor theory of intelligence also had something important to say about more conventional tests of scholarly attainment. It seemed that even school examinations tested for G to varying degrees. Indeed, Spearman reported that school disciplines could be arranged according to the hierarchy of their saturation by G. In Spearman's study, classics came top of the list as being the best indicator of intelligence. Mathematics was ranked below English and French. This reflects the disciplinary prejudices of the day, where the classics, which were taught at more elite schools, were seen as the highest discipline in the school hierarchy. Spearman was triumphant. To quote, Here, he wrote, would seem to lie the long-wanted, general, rational basis for public examinations. End quote. It was now possible, he argued, to defend high marks in Greek syntax as a good indicator of G, and therefore it was a reasonable test of the capacity of men, and this is quoting uh, Spearman again, it was a reasonable test of the capacity of men to command troops or to administer provinces. End quote. We see here, in other words, an argument justifying the use of examination to assign people to jobs. Effectively, here we have an early argument for meritocracy. It was now feasible Spearman contended, to objectively measure the extent to which public examinations reflect underlying ability. As he wrote, one can even conceive the establishment of a minimum index to qualify for parliamentary vote, and above all, for the right to have offspring. End quote. The liberal philosopher John Stuart Mill made a similar point decades earlier, suggesting that only the better educated should be allowed to vote. Any man should be allowed to qualify for this privilege, Mill argued, if, to quote Mill, he can prove that in spite of all difficulties and obstacles, he is in point of intelligence entitled to it. End quote. Still, a unitary or single scale for the measurement of intelligence was lacking. Subtracting the recorded mental age from the actual age on a Binet-Simon test provided a measure of apparent mental delay, but it was limited in that children of different ages could not be placed on the same scale. They were not comparable. You could only compare children of the same so-called mental age. What was required was a relative measure. Here, a division of the mental age by the chronological age would provide a relative rather than an absolute measure of disparity. 
This relative measure could then be compared between individuals of different ages. William Stern made this recommendation in 1912. He called this ratio, mental age divided by chronological age, the intelligence uh, quotient. In 1916, Lewis Terman removed the fractional appearance of the ratio by multiplying it by 100. This brought into existence the modern IQ scale with which we are now familiar. It provided a universal reference scale against which individuals could be compared and through which interventions could be justified. The Binet-Simon tests were translated and popularized in the United States by Henry Goddard, a psychologist seeking to better identify those at the borderlines of apparent normality. This group, he claimed, had been the most difficult to identify. Eugenicists became particularly concerned as they felt that members of this group would go undetected and would, uh, as Goddard claimed, be liable to become, as he felt uh, or as he feared, paupers, criminals, drunkards and prostitutes. For this reason, Goddard just justified identifying segregating children in this group and preventing them from having children themselves in the future. He also imagined that these tests might also be used to prevent the admission of immigrants, claiming that low intelligence, or what people were then calling low intelligence, was a serious threat to national well-being. A revision by the psychologist Lewis Terman, known as the Stanford Binet, was introduced in 1916 and soon became the benchmark against which subsequent intelligence tests were measured. It was standardized on 2,300 individuals and unlike the Binet-Simon test could be used for adults and in the measurement of so-called high intelligence too. This allowed testing to be extended to the entire population. Terman was optimistic that intelligence tests would soon become indispensable to what he called the educational engineer. He believed that those judged inferior by testing could be rounded up and institutionalized and certainly stopped from having children. He also claimed that the benefits to what he called industrial efficiency would be enormous and that it would virtually eliminate crime and poverty. You can see here just how much attention is being deflected from what others might see as the cause, at least of poverty, this being the evils of capitalism, state-sanctioned violence, and imperialism. We find so-called delinquency associated once again with mental deficiency. As Terman put it, all those judged to be feeble-minded are at least potential criminals, and every feeble-minded woman is a potential prostitute. End quote. Repeating the position taken by Carl Pearson, one of the key founders of statistics and a eugenic champion himself, we find that moral judgment is thought to be a function of intelligence. As Terman writes, morality cannot flower and fruit if intelligence remains infantile. Intelligence is not the blind following of a social impulse. End quote. So, as Terman and many other apparently rational men in his position decide, morality is the product of rational calculation. Morality is now a function of the newly developed concept of intelligence. And the most intelligent, as measured by their own systems of measurement, are people like Terman. The normal distribution, a statistical function, came into existence around this time. Indeed, as a hypothesis, it was first developed or applied to the idea of mental energy by Francis Galton, the founder of eugenics. According to the normal distribution, those of superior intellect are in a similar proportion to those of a uh, vastly inferior intellect. They are comparatively rare and therefore are rather special. According to eugenic science, it was clear enough to those of a eugenic mindset that, to quote Terman, 
the future welfare of the country hinges in no small degree upon the right education of these superior children, end quote. From the perspective of early 20th century eugenics, these superior children uh, also must be identified. As Terman argued, uh, here's a quote from Terman, through the handicapping influences of poverty, social neglect, physical defects, or educational maladjustments, many potential leaders in science, art, government, and industry are denied the opportunity of a normal development. The use we have made of exceptional ability reminds one of the primitive methods of surface mining. It is necessary to explore the nation's hidden resources of intelligence because the common saying that genius will out is one of the most dangerous half-truths with which too many people rest content." End quote. The educational engineer that Terman imagined now faced a range of possibilities. Intelligence tests could be used to reveal exceptional ability and allow for early promotion up the school. The risk of not taking such action, he argued, is that exceptional children might fall into, as he put it, lifelong habits of sub-maximum efficiency." End quote. Terman felt that children must be, must be pushed as hard to quote as their mental development would warrant under proper medical supervision, of course, end quote. The main danger, he wrote, in the case of such children is not over pressure, but under pressure, end quote. Intelligence tests could also be used more broadly, he argued, for placing all children within the school. This is said to be of particular use for the pupil of completely unknown abilities who enters the school system from another. Finally, Terman argues, intelligence tests could be applied to ascertain vocational fitness. Others would follow who would make a similar argument. They imagined a society in which testing would be so perfected that all jobs would be allocated according to intelligence tests. We see here an early argument for meritocracy. In part three, I explore these arguments further, including the awareness by the first proponents of eugenics and intelligence testing that the norms they described were not absolute, but were socially contingent.